Good morning. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we'd like to welcome you all to First Presbyterian Church in LeClaire. So nice to see so many familiar faces, our church family sitting in the pews this morning. And we'd like to welcome those who may be watching us as we do our live feed on Facebook and invite you folks who might be out there watching us to come join us on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. Uh, we're always here and we're a friendly church and like to meet new people, so please come join us. Today is Sunday, December 12th, 2021, and this is the third Sunday of Advent. This is the Sunday that we light the candle of joy. As always, our Lord has provided a wonderful day for us to worship. A little cool, but uh, every day is a wonderful day to worship our Lord and Savior. And let us not forget that He gave His only Son to us, and that He died on the cross to forgive our sins so that we might live with Him in heaven eternally if we but take Him as our Savior. Next Sunday is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we will uh, have our Christmas program, our children's Christmas program. So please come join us next Sunday. It's all, always a lot of fun. And no matter how the program turns out, it's always great, right? This Sunday, we have uh, Pastor Joyce Chamberlain joining us. Uh, Joyce has been here before, and we want to extend our, our gratitude and thanks to her for coming and helping us as we continue our transition at First Presbyterian Church with uh, Pastor Melody's retirement. So thank you so much. We know that announcements have been have been uh, cycling up there and you've been reading through those. We have a couple we'd like to uh, talk a little bit about. Um, we have our Christmas program practice right after service this morning. So uh, all the kids and parents, uh, please stay afterwards so we can run through that. Um, we have poinsettias. I think those are due. Or when are those due, Wendy? Don't you know? Today? Okay. So if you uh, have purchased a poinsettia for a loved one, please make sure that you get that turned in today. We have our second soup advent this coming Wednesday, but I see that I don't know if anybody signed up for that. So uh, we may make an announcement to cancel if there aren't any takers for that. Um, Christmas Eve service on the 24th at 3 o'clock. So if, you're, if you don't have a lot of Christmas activities and you want to come join us for a short Christmas Eve service, we'd love to see you. Sally. There are cookies and cake in the fellowship hall for the parents while we're doing our dress rehearsal right after church. So please go back to the fellowship hall for Monday and coffee. We also have, oh, Diane. Our child protection policy to help protect our children. Uh, I passed out forms that need to be filled out by anybody who's volunteering to help. So if I have given you one, please get it back to me so we can get with our police department and they can check you out. Um, and if I haven't given you one and you do work with the youth, with the children, um, okay. <laughs> Uh, and would like to have one filled out and be a part of our group, then contact me and I will do one. We also have a congregational care committee coming up, or meeting coming up on the 14th at 9 a.m. Uh, and on December 31st, we have our New Year's Eve party here at the church uh, through our congregational care committee. So if uh, you're so inclined and want to celebrate in the new year, come join us for that. Uh, Last thing I have, and then we'll we'll reach out to you folks, is again, this is the time of year where we reach out to the folks of the congregation for our, our love offering for those who work so hard during the year uh, to make our services enjoyable and meaningful, and certainly with Pastor Melody's leaving um, and retirement, a lot of weight has been put on other people's shoulders that wouldn't normally be placed there. So we ask you all to uh, prayerfully consider uh, a love offering for those folks um, who have kind of gone above and beyond and will continue to go above and beyond until uh, we have a replacement for Pastor Noah. Understand that it's uh, the last couple of years have been difficult for everybody, uh, but now is the time that we might be able to show some love uh, 
with those, those gifts. So a box is here in the back. And so if you haven't contributed and you want to, please put your love offering in there. Um, or reach out to Sally and get your love offering to Sally. Okay? Anything else? Any other announcements? Okay. With that, let's take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts, minds, and souls for worship. We lift our praise to you, O Lord. Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. It's time for a call to worship as we light the Advent candle. This third Sunday in Advent is joy, which comes from the Latin word gade, rejoice. Even in the midst of darkness, we are called to rejoice. Watch and wait for Christ's coming. We light this candle for peace. To those who live as exiles from home, to those enslaved due to oppression, to those who are trapped in sin, keep them from their best God promised selves. The Lord speaks the joy of good news. Sing aloud, O God of your mind. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O God of Jerusalem. 
the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. God has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem. Do not fear, O Zion. The Lord and your God is in your midst, the warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. I will heal all your oppressors. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord is my strength and my might. God invites us to open our lives to that tiny baby who arrives in Bethlehem this season. To this Holy One, let us release our transgressions that we might receive the peace and grace which is God gives to all who call upon his name. Emmanuel, please join me. Emmanuel, God with us, as we breathe in the sense and the sounds of your approaching arrival, we hunger for the peace that the prophets promised. We crave the sense of joy that this season offers, but there's something in the way. Worry and fear, resentment and guilt, striving and confusion. Help us to lay all of these distractions at your feet, that we might kneel by the manger to witness your amazing gift of life for all the world. And for each of us, here we are, Spirit of Life. Receive us in our brokenness and infuse us with the joy of your new life. Amen. Be, be assured, my friends, that the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven and made whole. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Cry. 
couldn't look them in the eye, denied the man went back to bed. And his wife asked who's there, said, I don't know. Just a girl, just a couple gypsies begging at the door. Told them we don't have room for any more. Close the door. The was a neighbor, he snuck out to the dirty stable, the two and found for covering, laid her in her suffering, the keeper knelt outside the barn, and in the light of that great star, he prayed, what have I done? He's just a baby, just minutes old there, trembling in the hay. Celebrating what's what's so special about Christmas? Yes, Jesus's birthday. Absolutely right. Jesus's birthday. And what do we do when we go home after we celebrate Jesus's birthday? We exchange what with people? Presents, gifts. So this is kind of the season of gifts. And so we have a nativity scene right here, right? So we have Mary, and we have Joseph, and we have little Jesus there, and we have the shepherds and the angels and all of the animals, and we have the three magi, or the three kings. Because when Jesus was born, the king saw a big star up in the sky. And that star was shining down over the manger and the stable that Jesus was in. And they knew something was very, very special about that. They knew 
that the king of the world had been born. The Messiah had been born and they wanted to come see him and they wanted to give Jesus gifts. So does anybody know the three gifts that the, the uh, kings and the Magi gave to Jesus? Remember, anybody know? What's that? Gold. 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 They brought Jesus gold. What the Magi did is they brought the most important things that they could think of where they were at to bring him. So they brought him gold. What about that? Anybody read that? It's myrrh. Okay, it's myrrh. So they brought him myrrh. It's not Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein. All right. So the three kings brought Jesus three gifts. Now, the, the thing about Christmas and the thing about Jesus is his birth was the greatest gift to the world. God sent his son down, Jesus, so that he would save all of us. So when you think about Christmas, I know when we go home, we're always, everybody's excited about Santa Claus coming, waking up in the morning and there's a presence under the tree. But the greatest gift any of us will ever get in our lives is Jesus. But with that, what's the greatest gift we can give him? And a nice little box here. Kind of income. It says, For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, the greatest gift. So, what do you think is the greatest gift that you can give him? We talked about this. What do you think? Who wants to be the first one to see what the greatest gift is? Love. Huh? Love. Gloves? Love. Love. Oh, I need to turn my hearing aid up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Love is a great gift. It is. What else? Peace. Peace. Peace is a super gift as well. What do you think? Hope. Hope. And? Yeah. What? You. Yeah. How about what do you see there? You, you just, who is that? You. Is that you? You see yourself in there? Yeah, you can see yourself. You can see yourself? Kai, can you see yourself in there? I'll get closer. <laughs> the greatest gift you can give Jesus is you. By accepting him as your savior and taking him into your heart so that you will have a peace and a place in heaven forever and ever and ever. So when you get up in the morning and you brush your teeth, everybody brushes their teeth in the morning, right? All right? Not just the tooth, all of them. All right? And you look in that mirror and you see you I want you to remember you are the greatest gift that you can give Jesus. All right? All right. Let's say an echo prayer. Dear God, yeah. let us always remember that the greatest Christmas gift ever given wasn't placed under the tree. He was placed on the tree. And his name is Jesus. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Are they going to uh, yeah. Sunday school? Yep. All right. Thanks. So good to see you all.
join me in our prayer of illumination? <clears throat> we come this morning, Lord, to seek your glory. Shine forth your goodness upon our heart as your word is read and proclaimed. Let us catch sparkles of starlight, melodies of angel choruses, visions of heavenly peace. Hold us in your embrace that we too might sparkle with your hope, sing of your glory, and spread forth your peace. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all the understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And our second reading is from the Gospel of Luke. It is the story of John the Baptist. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowd asks him, What then shall we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Amen. It happens, doesn't it? We are so filled with worry, with anxiety, with doubt, that we can't get our minds on anything else. We're grumpy. The night before, we hadn't slept with those images going through our head about all the rotten, crummy, horrible things that we fully expect to happen. And so then somebody, a friend, perhaps your spouse, your child, says something, and you just snap at them, you bite their head off, and at some level, it even feels good because you've just released the pressure. That is until you look at them and you see their face and you recognize what you've just done, and then you feel that big. What a crummy, horrible person you are. Not just me, I hope, right? Good, good. <laughs> You know, we humans, we are created to look into the future and we can see things that we expect to happen and that means worry. John and Paul both offer to us advice and Paul says, do not worry about anything, but in everything by power and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. He says, don't worry. Huh. 
It's easier said than done, let me tell you. Now that might be okay if what the issue is that you're late for a meeting or that you forgot to pick up milk for your kids' cereal tomorrow morning. But how about that time when your boss notifies you that he wants to meet with you next Tuesday, four days away, and you know that there are layoffs happening and that your division is especially vulnerable and that you were one of the last ones hired? How in the world are you going to pay the mortgage? How are you going to make the car payment to pay for your son's um, orthodontics? How are you going to pick up those last minute Christmas gifts? How are you going to celebrate a holiday if you've just been fired? Or your child has been to the doctor to get a biopsy and all signals are pointing towards that rotten, crummy C word. How do you not worry about that? How indeed? You know, worry might be a part of us. It might be built into us. And yet, at the same time, we sing, don't worry, be happy. But it's not that easy. And I think all of you would recognize it's just not that easy. But one thing I note in looking at our scriptures today, and that is that John, John the Baptist, seems to almost promote worry. He says this way, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is raised up from these very stones, children of Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And as we read that, our anxiety comes up. Is our life filled with good fruit? Is that us? But one of the things that I know is that John the Baptist, he needed to get their attention. There were people who came who were truly looking for the word of God, truly looking for how they could in enact with God and engage God and live better lives. But there were also people who came for the show. We hear in Matthew about John that he was living out in the wilderness, that he was dressed in clothing made of camel's hair, that he was eating wild honey and locusts. And then this thing called baptism, it wasn't something that the people were familiar with, at least not the good Jewish people of Jerusalem. Baptism was for those people who wanted to be a part of Judaism, who wanted to be a part of this love of God, but were quite ready to go the route of circumcision. And so they could cling to the lower rungs of the ladder, but they were still there. Those were the ones who were baptized. But John was inviting the folks from Jerusalem, the sons and daughters of Abraham, to engage in this process of repentance and receiving a new understanding of their faith by going into the River Jordan and being baptized. He needed to get the attention of the folks around him. And so he offers these words. Now, the bottom line is that Paul has some of the same things to say. He has the words that says, let your gentleness be known to everyone. John says to them, you know, get your act together. Live the way God intends. Paul says, let your gentleness be known. And both of these are wanting him to love your neighbor as yourself. Both of them are inviting the people of Jerusalem to get out of their own head, get out of their own bubble, to take care of others, to consider, to love, to be a part of that community. John to the tax collectors, now these are the bad boys of that era, said to them that they should only take what the law demands. Don't line your pockets. Don't get rich off the sweat of the brow of others. Don't lift your station to their detriment. He says to the soldiers, again, people who had great power, 
He said, don't extort. Don't make false accusations. Don't um, destroy lives. Now to both of these, he doesn't say to leave their station in life. He doesn't say, get out of that and go to some monastery and sit. He doesn't say to them, go collect orphans and widows and take care of them. He said, use your power wisely and well. He says to the people that they should take care of one another. He says to them that they should look out for one another. Now, you and I might think that we don't have any power. We might think that, who are we? We're just, we're just nobody. But, but we do have power, don't we? We have the power of the checkbook. We have the power of the ballot box. We have power, some of us, in our jobs. We have power in our families, with our neighbors. We have the ability to make life better for someone or worse for someone. And both John and Paul suggest that we make life better, that we live into this community. Now, you might ask, what does that have to do with worry? Last week, I watched a movie. I do that once in a while. And in this movie, the, one of the main characters was an alcoholic. And he was arguing with a friend of his about why he should go to AA. He would maybe not hit exactly the bottom of the barrel, but he was pretty darn close. He'd lost his job. He'd lost his family. He'd crashed his car. He had lost his driver's license. He had lost his self-respect. He was pretty much lost. But he was arguing, why should he go to AA meetings? What could sitting around a room talking about things possibly help him with his addiction? And the friend said something that I think is something for all of us. This friend reminded him that in those meetings there would be others who would accept him and not judge him, who understood his situation. That was important. But even more important, even more, he was going into those meetings to help someone else, to be accepting of someone else, to be understanding of someone else, to offer assistance to someone else. And that the more that he could be there for others, the less he would live within the bubble of his own grief and worry and addiction. To be out in the world, to be engaged with others, to be offering assistance and care and love means to expand our horizons in such a way that maybe our own stuff isn't quite as poisonous, isn't quite as viral within our being. To care about others, to love others. And that becomes, I think, something that both John and Paul could endorse, endorse. To step out of worry means to step into a world at large, to offer ourselves to others. It creates communities. Now, the other part of that is that 90% of the time, the stuff that we worry about, it, it, it doesn't happen, right? So we've just wasted all that energy. And the times that it does, if you really do get laid off at Christmas time, if you really do have that diagnosis of malignant when that biopsy comes back, if we've been reaching out, if we've been engaging, then God will put others in our path, will allow us to walk with companionship and love and assistance. And the more that we can be in the path with another, the more we can trust that others will be in the path with us. And that too allows worry to dissipate and to go away. This is the time of the year when we rejoice that God gives to us a savior. It's not about presents under the tree. It's not about the perfectly decorated Christmas cookie. It's not about the bonus that you're hoping to get or the Christmas cards 
or that party that everybody wants to go to that you've now been invited. It's about a savior that was offered to us. Someone who saves not just an eternal life, but who saves us right now to live better lives, happier lives, lives fulfilled by walking in community with others, lives that have meaning and purpose and that give us joy. This is a time of year when we prepare the way of the Lord, where we cleanse our hearts and our souls, where we chase away those, the spider webs and dust us, ourselves off so that we can kneel beside a manger, so that we can see the star in the sky and sing with the angels and know that peace upon earth is God's desire for those folks out there and for us. Rejoice, Paul says. Again, I say rejoice. If this is not the time of year when we can do that, when is? And so, my friends, don't worry. God's got you. Amen.
Savior, we return to you a portion of the overflowing blessings you have bestowed upon us. Most importantly, we offer you our hearts and our praise. Receive these humble gifts that they might offer hope and healing to our hurting world. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you rescue the daughter of Zion from her enemies and take away the judgments against her. Look with compassion upon your people wherever they suffer for the name of Jesus. Give them wisdom when they are pressured to compromise. Provide, provide when they suffer loss. Give courage when they are afraid and strengthen them in the midst of persecution until you deliver them. Preserve them always in the joyful hope that you will restore all that is lost with what cannot be taken away. Almighty God, as you once sent messengers before the face of Jesus to prepare his way, so strengthen and encourage all pastors and church workers as they make known his saving name. Open the ears of all who hear to rejoice, repent, and firmly believe. O giver of all good gifts, look upon the households of your people. Provide companionship for those who are alone. Strengthen the bonds of marriage and equip parents to raise their children in love and faith. Grant that our homes may be places of joy, reasonableness, peace, and prayer. Lord, you set the prisoners free. Remember those who are incarcerated justly and grant that they might repent, be freed from the clutches of sin. Accept the consequences of their wrongdoing and learn to live honestly and peacefully. Remember all those who are imprisoned unjustly. Restore their freedom according to your will and preserve them in your grace and the confidence that you know what is true and just. Heavenly Father, your Son became the flesh and healed the sick of all kinds of diseases and afflictions, demonstrating his power and giving us a foretaste of the resurrection on the last day. Have mercy upon all those in need of deliverance. We pray today and every day for our members and friends in nursing homes, all veterans, servicemen and women, and their families, all who have been sentenced to life without parole, all fire, law enforcement, and EMS personnel. We pray for Pat and Jim Collins, Jesse Boardman, Donna Lutman, Marilyn Bailey, Tom Bloomingdale, Janet Kirk Bartlow, Rick Mulvania, Elsie Chamberlain, Heather Christie, Maurice and Spinsby, Paul and Diane's son John. We pray for Heather Chapman, for Christ Boy, Ken Stinson, Sally's daughter in law Lori, Wes and Joyce's daughter Anna, Marilyn's daughter Candy, Janet Kirk's daughter Amber and son in law Chris, Chris and Colleen's family on the passing of their aunt Joan, Glenda and Kirk's daughter Paula. In mission starfish Haiti. Heal them in your time and according to your will and preserve them in the confidence that you will deliver your people from all afflictions at the resurrection of all flesh. Lord God, the Son of Man came eating and drinking with sinners that he might proclaim the kingdom and welcome them in by the forgiveness of sins. Let us remember each and every day his words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of of sins. Into you, your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let us join in one voice in one voice as we pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Oh, rise your love. 
And I know that you, like I, have been watching the news and have seen the absolute devastation that the tornadoes have wrecked upon just so many areas and people. Um, can we take just a moment to offer prayer, a special prayer for them? Will you bow with me? God of grace, upon the people who are so devastated with those tornadoes, we ask that your peace and your love might descend. We know that there are people all over the area that are digging out and who are working so very hard to find survivors. We know that there are people who are weeping because their loved one is gone. And we know that there are people who are absolutely in shock because they don't have a place to go home to. Upon all of them, Lord, allow your love and your grace to descend that our love can be known to them as well. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And now may we go into the world. May we go in peace. May we go in the assurance that God loves us. May we go spreading that joy. May we go living in gentleness. And may we go knowing that Christ comes in our hearts and in our world. Go in peace. <laughs>